Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Part 4 The Stock Eye Chapter 19 Narrative resumed by Jim Hawkins The Garrison in the Stock Stockade As soon as Ben Gunn saw the colours, he came to a halt, stopped me by the arm and sat down. Now, said he, where's your friends, sure enough? Far more likely it's mutineers, I answered. That, he cried, why, in a place like this, but nobody puts in uh, but gentlemen of fortune. Silver would fly the jolly folk, Roger. You don't make no doubt of that. No, that's just that's your friends. There's been blows too. I reckon your friends has been, had the best of it. And here they are sure in the old stockade as it, it was made years and years ago by Flint. Ah, he was a man to have a headpiece, was Flint, barring rum. His match were never see were never seen. He was afraid of none but he. Only silver. Silver was that gentile. Well, said I, that might be so, and so be it. All the more reason I should hurry on and join my friends. Nay, mate, returned Ben, not you. You're a good old boy, if I mistook. But you're only a boy, you told. Now, Ben Gunn is fly. Rum wouldn't bring me there. Where are you going? No, not rum, won't. Till I see you born gentleman, and gets it. On its word of honour, and don't forget my words, a precious sight, as all you say, a precious sight, and all confidence, and then nip, and nips him. He pitched me a third time, a shame air of cleverness. And when gun, when gun is what gun, when gun is wanted, you know where to find him, Jim. Just where you found him today, and him that comes is to have a white thing on his hand, and needs to come alone. Oh, and you say this, Ben Gunn, says you, as reasons of his own. Well, said I, I believe I understand you have something to propose. You wish to see the squire, the doctor. You're to be found where I found you. Is that at all? And when, says says you, he added, why you form about noon conversations about ten and six bells. Good, said I, and may I, now may I go? You won't forget, he cried anxiously. Precious sight and reasons of his own, says you. Reasons of his own. That's main stay as between man and man. Well then, still beckoning me. I reckon you go, go, Jim. And Jim, if you see Silver, you won't go for t for t to sell Ben Gunn. Old horses won't draw it for you. No, says you. If them pirates camp ashore, Jim, what would you say but they'd be widows in the morning? He is interrupted by a loud report and a cannonball came tearing through the trees and pitched in the sand not a hundred yards from where we two were talking. Next moment each of us had taken to his heels in a different direction. For a good hour to come to come, frequent reports shook the island. Balls kept crashing through the woods. They moved from the hiding place to the hiding place. Always pursued, or so it seemed to me, by those terrifying missiles. But towards the end of the bombardment, though still I dost not venture in the direction of the stockade, the bulls fell off the nest. I began in a manner to pluck up my heart again, and after the long detour to the east, crept down among the side, shoreside trees. The sun had just set, the sea breeze was rustling and tumbling in the woods and ruffling the grey surface of the anchorage. The tide too was far out, and great tracts of sand lay uncovered in the air. After the heat of the day chilled me through my jacket. Hispania still lay where she had anchored, but sure enough, there was a jolly roger, a black fag of piracy, flying from her peak, even as I look. There came another red flash and another report. It set the echoes clattering, and one more round shot whistled through the air. Is the last of the cannonade. 
I lay for some time watching the bustle which succeeded the attack. Men were demolishing something with axes on the beach near the stockade of Jolly, poor Johnny Boat. I afterwards discovered, anyway, away near the mouth of the tr- river, a great fire was growing, glowing among the trees behind that, between that point the ship. One of the geese kept coming and going, a man whom I had seen so gloomy, shouting at the oars like children. But they were, there was a sound in those voices which suggested rum. At length I thought I might return towards the stockade, as pretty far down on the low. Sandy spit that encloses the anchorage to the east. It joined at the half water to skeleton island. Now as I rose to my feet, I saw some distance further down the spit and rising from among the low bushes, I see rock pretty high, particularly white. Peculiarly white in colour. It occurred to me that this might be the white rock which Ben Gunn had spoken, and that some day or another a boat might be wanted. I should know where to look for one. Then I skirted among the woods until I had regained the rear, a shorewood side of the stockade, and was soon warmly welcomed by the faithful party. I soon told my story and began to look about me. The log house made of unsquared trunks of pine, roof, walls, and floor. That had stood in several places as much as a foot or a foot and a half above the surface of the sand. There's a porch at the door, and underneath this porch a little spring welled up into an artificial basin, a rather odd kind, now other than a great ship's kettle of iron, with the bottoms knocked out. And sunk to her bearings, as a t- captain said, Among the sand, little been left beside the framework of the house. In one corner, there was a stone slab laid down by the way of the heath, an old rusty iron basket to contain the fire. The slopes of the knoll and all the inside of the stockade had been cleared of the timber to build a house. You could s- see by the stumps what a fine and lofty grove had been destroyed. Most of the soil had been washed away or buried in drift of removal of the trees. Only where the streamlet run down from a kettle, a thick bed of moss, some ferns and little creeping, creeping bushes were still green among the sand. Very close around the stockade, too close for defence, they say. They said the wood still flourished, high and dense, all of fur on the lion side, but towards the sea, with a large of mixture of live oaks, the cool evening breeze of which I have spoken whistled through every clink of the rude building and sprinkled to the floor with continual rain, fine sand. There was sand in our eyes, sand in our teeth, sand in our suppers, sand dancing in the spring, a bottom of the kettle, all the well like porridge beginning to boil. Our chimney was a square hole in the roof. It was but a little part of the smoke that found its way out. This I edited about the house and kept us coughing and peering in the eye. As this at grey, the new man had his face tied up in a bandage for a cut he'd got him breaking away from the mutineers. And poor old Ted Roof, still unburied, lay along the, bottom, along the wall, stiff and stark under the Union Jack. If he had been allowed to sit idle, we would... We should have all have fallen in the blues, but Captain Smollett was never the man for that. All hands were called up before him and he invited us to watch his. Dr. and Gray and I were one to one. The squire, Hunter and Joyce found upon the other. Tired as though we were all were. Two were sent out for the firewood. Two were sent to dig a grave for red roof. The doctor was called named Cook. I had put I had put on sentry at the door. Captain himself went from one to the other, keeping up my spirits and lending a hand wherever it was wanted. From time to time, the doctor came to the door with a little air, dressed his eyes, which were almost smoked out of his head, and whenever he did so, he had a word for me. That man Smollett, he said once, is a better man than I am, and when I say that, it means a deal with him. 
Another time he came as silent for a while. Then he put his head to one on the side and looked at me. Is that step Ben Gunner man? he asked. I do not know, sir, said I. I'm not very sure whether he's sane. If there's any doubt about the matter, he has returned the doctor. A man had been for three days biting his nails on the desert island, Jim. Can't expect to appear as sane as you or me. Doesn't lie in human nature. Is it cheese you said he had a fancy for? Yes, sir, cheese, I answered. Well, Jim, says he, to see the good that comes of some d- dignity in your food. You see myself of, haven't you? You never saw me take snuff. The reason being that in my snuff box, I carry a piece of parmesan cheese. Cheese made in Italy, very nutritious. Well, that's the bingo. Before supper was eaten, we buried old Tom in the sand and stood round him a while bareheaded in the breeze. Good deal of fire would have been got in, but not enough the captain's fancy shook his head over it and told us we must get back to this tomorrow rather livelier. Then, when we had eaten our pork and each had a good stiff glass of brandy grog, the three chiefs got together in the corner to discuss our prospects. Appears they were at their wits end. What to do to stop being so low? We must have been starved into surrender before help came. But our best hope decided was to kill off the buccaneers till they either hauled down their flag or ran away from the Hestonia. From nineteen, they were already reduced to fifteen. Two others were wounded, one at least. A man shot behind them, beside the gun, severely wounded, if he were, if he were not dead. Every time we had a crack at them, we were to take it, saving our own, our own lives with extremest care. Besides that, we had the two able allies, rum and a climate. As to the first, though, we were about half a mile away. We could hear them roaring and singing late into the night. As for the second, the doctor's statement week, a count where they were in the marsh and provided with remedies. Half of them would be on their backs before a week. So he added, if we're not all shot down first, they'd be glad to be packing in the schooner. And I've always it's always a ship. They can't they can can get to Buccaneering again, I suppose. First ship was that, that ever I lost, said Captain Smollett. I was dead tired, as you fancy. And when I got to sleep, which is not till after a great deal of tossing, I slept like a log of wood. The rest had been up and had already breakfasted, increased the pile of firewood by about inch as much, about as half as much again, when I was awakened by a bustle and sound of voices. Flag of truce, I heard someone say. Flag of truce, I heard someone say, immediately after the cry of surprise, Silver himself. And that, and at that, I up, I jumped, and rubbing my eyes, ran to a loophole in the wall.